Hello, everyone, and welcome to WooStream, where we are bringing the Willamette community together. For today's presentation, entitled The Theory and Practice of Working Remotely, we are joined by Jonathan Scrimente. He will talk about something that many of us have been experiencing for the first time, working remotely, and perhaps even managing others who are doing the same. In the next 40 minutes, Jonathan will share some current research and models of how trust and communication intersect for remote employees. Jonathan serves as the Assistant Director of Career Management at the Atkinson School of Management. All right, Jonathan, take it away. All right, hello everyone. Pleasure to join you uh, today. Thank you, Eric, so much for the introduction. Um, today we'll be focusing on the elements of trust and communication as a result uh, and plays out for us as remote employees. So let me begin by sharing the slide deck with you. And for a while, I'm gonna turn off the video so you can focus on the slides, and then Eric and I will pop back in towards the end of the presentation. So many of us who are starting to ro work remotely for the first time, we're not starting from scratch. We have a foundation of shared values and experiences to build upon. And that actually, I think, gives us a boost up compared to employees who are starting uh, and working completely remotely and may only meet their coworkers for the first time um, at like a company conference or something like that. So the reason I bring that up for those of us uh, who are going into a temporary remote work setting, just keep in mind that you do have that foundation of values and experiences and you have seen your coworkers in that physical space and you can always draw upon that to move forward. So let's jump into the first uh, topic for today, trust and communication. Typically, trust and communication are separate behavioral constructs. However, in remote work, there's so much less transparency that the constructs of trust and communication have received a lot of attention in the literature. And in fact, trust and communication tend to be the only two indicators of performance in remote work because there is nothing else to go on, lacking that physical um, env office environment. So I'd like to review three different models with you today. The first is called the additive model. And this one states that trust and communication are directly linked to perceived performance. However, they operate independently. So you can have one without the other and still get to a high level of perceived performance. Now let's look at an example or two to make that just a little bit clearer. So an individual who is considered trustworthy or more trustworthy, they would tend to receive the benefit of the doubt with respect to performance more than those who are considered less trustworthy. Now the same as well with communication. High levels of communication by an individual have also been linked positively to his or her level of performance. Now those uh, colleagues on our team that may be on the more talkative side, those are the ones who are establishing norms within our virtual work teams. So again, the frequency of communication and also the substance, um, the, the quality of the communication, those are established by those who are contributing on a more regular basis. As well, those who might be perceived as more talkative, um, they enjoy something, a benefit called positive affectivity. And really just what that means is that their communications tend to be more positive and it, it creates this cooperative feel with colleagues. And so naturally their uh, communication is going to be perceived positively and thus their performance is going to be perceived positively as well. Now naturally that begs the question, what about, the, what about the introverts or the folks who like to really think things through before they respond? And that's absolutely needed in the work environment. But according to this model, those folks would want to really lean on the element of trust as a way to increase their perceived performance. And that might look like sharing articles with colleagues related to your work or establishing, your, establishing yourself as a thought leader um, regarding a certain topic, especially if communication is going to be a little bit uh, delayed or something along those lines, uh, I, would lean on uh, I would lean on trust as a way to build uh, elements of positively perceived performance. 
All right, jumping over to the second model. This one is called the interaction model, and this states that trust facilitates high performance. So in more plain English, um, it is saying that trust affects the way we judge the communication output of others. So no matter how good the communication might be, without trust, colleagues are likely to be cautious or wary of one another. And one of the reasons trust might play a moderating role is because it also affects how one interprets the past or present actions of the other party. And I'd actually like to share a real life example of that that might uh, bring, this to, to bring this to better life a, a little bit. Um, in a previous organization I was a part of, uh, there was a large change going on and a colleague, uh, it was actually the CEO, um, delivered a message that again was very positive, forward thinking, um, kind of trying to lift everyone's spirits up in a time of change. However, I did not have trust with that person so my perceived performance of that in individual, individual was actually fairly low. Now later on, uh, a different leader delivered a very similar message. Let's be positive about this change. It's gonna be okay. Here's all what we're doing to get through this together. Um, I did trust that leader and their delivery of that message. And my perception of their performance was very positive. So really trust again, facilitates high performance based on communication. Now let's jump over to the last model called the mediation model. And I think that this one is probably the most straightforward of the three. And what it states is that trust mediates the effect of communication on performance. So this one is very sequential. Um, we don't know if the other person is actually working, unlike the physical office environment. So when we're in this remote um, environment, we need communication to build trust in order to perceive others' performance positively. And again, we see that very sequential steps, sequ sequential steps there. Now, in more practical terms, I think that the more uh, communication we see from our colleagues in the virtual environment, the more likely we are to be exposed to their thoughts, um, the, the, the way that they process information, the way they think, the way they're constructing arguments. And some of that background information, um, it leads to that trust because we understand again, the way they're thinking and where they're coming from. Um, and then once we understand that, that builds trust, which leads again to perceived performance. So that's a, a little bit more of a linear, uh, straightforward model of the interaction of communication and trust on perceived performance. Overall, I would say these three models are saying uh, different things rather than trying to take an opposing stance, for example. Now, the value here um, is that you can identify how you work, how, how do you personally construct trust and communication in relation to performance. Maybe you can kind of figure out how your colleagues are doing that as well and make adjustments. And really by sharing these three models, I hope that this makes your transition to the world of remote work just a little bit easier. All right, so let's jump into something a little bit more practical rather than, rather than three models. Um, I'd like to talk about trust facilitating communication behaviors and member actions. And that's broken up into two different stages early on in a team's life, and then later on in a team's life. And we'll kind of go through it in that sequence there. So let's start with communication behaviors that facilitate trust, but early on in a group's life. So typically we would expect some social communication for groups um, that, for their communication that will facilitate trust early on in life. And that might just look exactly like water cooler talk. So when you're hopping on a conference call, talking about what was successful yesterday, um, how's your family, uh, how's the world of virtual work, whatever those questions are. And then a sense of uh, communicating enthusiasm as well. Just last week, I was talking with a coworker over chat and uh, launching a new, a new project for our department in, that is a result of working virtually. And she goes, I'm so glad to be a part of this. We're the dream team, exclamation mark. Um, and just that one comment, again, it, that enthusiasm, it's so contagious. Um, and it just kind of motivated me a little bit more. I was like, you know what? Yeah, we can do this, absolutely. 
So moving on um, to late in a team's life, um, predictable communication, and then substantial and timely responses. So what we really want is to understand how often and how regularly, what is the response time like that we're gonna hear from our coworkers? Um, what is the substance behind it? Is there actually going to be enough of a response from my coworkers that I can move forward on a project? Or is it going to take 25 emails back and forth, something like that? So kind of getting into the right rhythm of substantial and timely responses. So those are all communication behaviors that facilitate trust. Let's move over to what can individual members do that will facilitate trust. So certainly coping with technical uncertainties. Uh, we all know that there's gonna be a hiccup or two. Um, and I think just being gracious with those, allowing um, those organizing the technology, um, giving, them a giving them a little bit of breathing space. Um, and again, being flexible. Individual initiative. Um, in the remote environment, I think it's hard for us to get a sense of who's excited about things and what, you know, getting volunteers to drive things forward. So I definitely recommend folks as you're able and as you have the time, step up and take on um, that next project or, or offer to move something forward that goes a long way in building trust among colleagues in the virtual environment. Uh, moving on to later in a team's life, um, we wanna move from social to procedural to a task focus in our communication. Um, Certainly that foundation of social is great and talking about how we're going to work is important as well. But we really do, again, want to focus on the task. What is it that we need to get done in this remote environment and how is it different? Is it different? Um, and let's focus on getting that task done. Displaying positive leadership as well uh, is important. We want to make sure that everyone on our team is excited, they're good to go. Um, and then there's this kind of this can do attitude and figuring out what does everyone bring to the table that's going to make this remote environment successful. And then finally, um, having a flag, phlegmatic response to crisis. Um, what that's saying basically is that we want a calm disposition. Um, it, it's likely that something's going to happen um, in the virtual or the remote work world, just like things happen in our physical world as well. And we don't want to be chicken level with the sky falling, but we want to take a very calm um, and, and unemotional, not necessarily cold, um, but I would say maybe more a measured response to crisis. Um, and I think that relates back to the positive leadership, um, showing and saying that, you know, we can get through this and here's how we're going to do that. All right. So up in the upper right-hand corner, you see a screenshot of a gentleman uh, from Seinfeld. Um, and maybe some of you watched that series. I wanna say, gosh, this is back in the 90s. Um, this gentleman's name is George Costanza. And George had a friend named Elaine, and he was also beginning to date a woman. I believe her name was Susan, if I remember correctly. And George had a great relationship with his friend Elaine, but also a great relationship uh, with his new girlfriend, Susan. And Elaine and Susan had never met until one day Elaine said, hey, Susan, why don't we hang out? And the funny part of the episode is George had this, oh gosh, I can't even describe his reaction. Um, but it was, worlds are colliding, you're killing independent George. Um, and the reason being is that he didn't want his social life with his friend Elaine and the other characters on the show to intersect, and I think in his perspective, interfere negatively with uh, his self as boyfriend George with, uh, with Susan. So worlds are colliding. And I think that starts, and I think that really relates to what's going to happen or what might be happening with us as remote workers. And this relates back to something called boundary theory. And boundary theory suggests that being continuously and simultaneously available to work and family might breed conflict for remote workers. So boundary theory really focuses on how individuals manage and negotiate the work and the family sphere and the borders between them in order to attain balance. And there's two possible ways that the literature suggests going about doing this. The first one is called the integration approach. 
and that allows employees to easily transition between roles. So for example, maybe you've got your laptop, you're working in the kid's playroom, um, you know, you're focusing on work, but you're making sure that the child is safe. Um, a colleague from a different university this morning said that the first five minutes of every, of their virtual morning huddle, the, sorry, their virtual morning huddle is actually dedicated to an integration approach where they allow um, kids or pets or family members to jump on the call as well to kind of see who is mommy and daddy or who is my partner working with every day. So that would be an example of the integration approach. Segmentation, on the other hand, tries to help avoid any negative spillover. So what that's really seeking to do is preserve the uniqueness of each role. So when you're in work time, you're in work time. When it's family time, it's family time. And what that might look like, for example, is having a sign on your office door that says, you must knock before you, before you come in. You just can't run into mommy's office during the day. Or if you take a coffee break every day at 10, 15 in the office, you're also taking a coffee break at 10, 15 every day at home, whatever that looks like. Um, one thing I found interesting um, in the literature was that men tended to choose the segmentation approach and women tended to choose the integration approach. Now, in summary, uh, you know, the choice between integration and segmentation is ultimately yours. Um, I can really just recommend that you choose the style that, compensate, that compensates for this environment. It's highly integrated um, with work and family in the same physical space. So whatever is most beneficial to you in managing those competing demands, go for that. And it might actually even require a little trial and error, but give yourself that grace to do that. All right, let's jump over to some remote tips for managers. Um, first, I'd say uh, focusing on both task and relational needs with your employees. Certainly, they've got a job to get done, and you can ask about that. You can ask about processes, um, just like you normally would with any regular touch bases with your employees, but also focus on their relational needs. Do they have a connection back to um, the mission of the organization? Do they have connections within the organization to get their job done? Um, what are those relational needs that they, that they have? And that kind of jumps into the second point that I touched on a little bit, uh, continuing to focus on the mission as a way to keep them motivated and engaged. And this has got to be something related to the mission beyond making a profit. Um, maybe it's innovation or it, like in the technology or the healthcare industry. Um, in education, it's fairly easy for us because we want to see our students develop and grow. So whatever that looks like, help your employees see how, they're, what, how what they're doing, even though it's remote, how that continues to deliver on the mission of your organization. And when that does happen, encourage them and recognize their success. So if that looks like maybe a virtual happy hour or something else along those lines, um, maybe a positive write-up in the company newsletter or something like that, um, whatever you can do to kind of recognize employees who are successfully transitioning to remote work um, and also delivering on that mission. Uh, we do want to continue to set clear output requirements. So if that's 85 widgets a day, that is the output requirement. However, um, I don't recommend managers, uh, when you have your touch base with employees, jumping exactly to, so your goal is 85 widgets this week. How are you going to get that done? Um, or are you getting that done? Um, I would ask more open-ended and broad questions, um, asking them to, you know, tell me about the process. What is it like working from home? Um, are you having challenges? What are you finding that's easy um, in terms of widget production? How is it different? Um, and kind of maybe guiding them to a plan in a more Socratic method rather than a top-down, you need to hit your output requirements um, uh, approach. I think you'll find more success in the, in the open-ended questions. And then finally, for, for managers, um, it's easy for us to not, not intentionally hoard information when we're in the physical environment, but we're talking to everyone so much uh, on, a, on a regular basis. But when we're communicating in an asynchronous environment, I'd encourage you to share information a little bit more than you would. Don't act as the hub of information, get it out there as soon as you can. We don't necessarily know where our team members are on certain projects. So as you're able to give them information, uh, it might help them complete their, 
uh, projects on a, on a timely basis. All right, for those of us working remote, um, as you've probably read, there's uh, plenty of advice out there in terms of structuring your hours and distractions. Um, I just wanna acknowledge that, definitely follow up. Um, there's, there, there's plenty of advice out there on, on those topics, as well as limiting uh, TV, bill paying, online shopping. Uh, this, is not, this is not the time for that. Um, I, I think the distraction um, and the thought often can be, great, I need a brain break. I'm going to pay my bills or change the laundry or online shopping, whatever that looks like. Um, I'd actually encourage you to think about it maybe a little in a different way. Um, so when it's time for a break, um, certainly grab some water, whatever that looks like that you would normally do in the regular office. But when it's time to switch activities, use a different part of your brain. So if you're doing something analytical, maybe you want to jump over to creating a PowerPoint, for example. Um, if you've been doing a lot of reading, it's probably not time to go into writing because you're doing the same, uh, you're using the same part of your brain. So just in the virtual uh, remote world, world of work, just making sure that you're switching that up as much as you can. Uh, please be careful of subtext when we're communicating um, remotely. For example, let's talk can mean a couple different things. It could mean, Jonathan, that idea you just proposed is absolutely crazy, you're out of your mind, dot, dot, dot. So let's talk could come across negative. Let's talk could also mean, oh my gosh, Jonathan, that idea is great. I can't wait to further discuss that with you. I'm really busy right now, but let's talk, exclamation mark. Um, I don't know how to perceive let's talk, um, and I'm guessing your colleagues don't either. So as much as you can, uh, be sure to explain yourself uh, when you're communicating. Um, scheduling re regular check-ins with each other and having milestones, I think is really important. Again, because we don't have that physical um, I can't walk down the hall and ask Jim, hey, where are we on this? Or um, can you fill me in about this conversation you had? Um, so regular check-ins will kind of take the place of those informal conversations. And then milestones, it shares kind of a, sh uh, I would say it creates a shared ownership and uh, shared timelines of when things are going to get done. Um, so as much as you can, use technology to create uh, check-ins, but then also milestones as well that can be shared with colleagues. Um, having an after-work ritual is really important um, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, for your own mental, let's call it mental sanity. Um, how will you know if you're working from home that work is over? What is kind of that symbolic thing um, that's going to represent, okay, work is ending, now I'm back to family life. Is it going for a run, maybe opening your favorite bottle of wine, um, whatever that looks like, go ahead and incorporate um, something into your routine that tells you, okay, I need to stop working now. It's time to move on to other aspects of life. And then finally, as just as a general reminder, um, exercising, eating healthy, definitely important in the uh, remote environment, uh, especially now that we are um, having limited ability to go out and socialize after work in this COVID-19 environment. Uh, I just want to promote exercise and healthy eating. All right, let's talk about the last place, workplace um, isolation. Um, just a couple tips here to uh, help combat that. We know that um, workplace well-being, it's important as it correlates to higher levels of job satisfaction, commitment to the organization, um, increased discretionary effort, better staff retention. So if we can combat this workplace isolation, I think we're going to improve workplace well-being. So here's just a couple tips on avoiding workplace isolation. Frequent video check-ins. I know the team that I'm on, we're having a video check-in every morning at nine o'clock. Um, and sometimes it's a normal full hour and we have a lot to get through. Um, sometimes it might be a little bit on the shorter side because we do have a lot to get through um, uh, in terms of individual contributions. So our group check-in might be a little bit shorter. Um, but as someone who works from home, I really do enjoy seeing my colleagues every day, just like I would in the physical environment. And it has helped us kind of prevent that feeling of I'm just out there in nebula working and not really sure what else is going on in other people's worlds. Um, shared checklists and discussions about progress. I think we touched on this a little bit earlier, but it does create that sense of 
I'm not just working on this alone. I can see exactly where Jim, Susie, and Mary Jo are on the project, um, and we can discuss our progress. Um, you do want to set, set aside time for our professional meetups, and again, maybe not in the physical sense, um, but I know the professional organizations I've been a part of, they've been holding a couple different sessions um, virtually for, for members. Some of them are more fun. Um, I did not attend the Jazzercise this morning. Um, another colleague of mine did and said it was very uplifting and engaging, um, and, and she really enjoyed it. Um, earlier today, I did attend a virtual uh, meetup for those of us in, in career services for MBA programs, just to kind of talk about um, and learn from colleagues across the country what, what our employer is doing. Um, and what are students finding in terms of the job and internship search. So I would just recommend as much as you can, find some way to connect either um, with colleagues in your organization or outside of your organization um, to get that physical, I'm sorry, not physical, uh, but, but that sense of human connection, um, but also an understanding of what's going on outside of maybe your own uh, work environment. As well, opportunities for informal collaboration um, just as you would, um, you know, water cooler chat in the physical world, uh, the physical office environment, I would just uh, suggest creating opportunities for informal collaboration. So if there's a project that needs to move forward or a new initiative that now that we're working remotely, um, how many, you know, getting the right number of people and the right folks together on the same call, um, just to kind of simulate that collaborative environment. Um, can be helpful to combat work, workplace isolation. And finally, I would just recommend, I would just recommend um, keeping in mind this is temporary, hang in there. Um, we will be back uh, to the physical office environment at some point. Um, so whatever you need to do to uh, combat that workplace isolation, again, um, we want everyone to be satisfied with their jobs, committed to the organization. Um, you know, I, I, I said uh, increased discretionary effort earlier. I think that ties back to members taking up and sh uh, sorry, uh, taking up projects and showing initiative. Um, and then hopefully this results in better staff retention as well. Um, so just to kind of summarize, I hope what I've shared with you today um, will help you, will help your team through this time so that we're experiencing strong workplace well-being and we're all contributing the best we can back to our organizations. Um, so I'm going to stop the slide share here and hop back on camera. All right, there we go. All right, wow, thanks for that, Jonathan. That's been that's that is some really good stuff. Um, as I listened to your presentation and watched along, um, I, I'm curious, and hopefully our audience members are as well. What first got you interested in organizational development and this topic specifically? Absolutely. Um, as a kid, I don't think anyone says I want to go into or organizational development, right? <laughs> um, you know, I really just think it was, at least for me, it was my own professional growth. Um, so, I, you know, I really had the opportunity to grow within a particular, in a previous professional life um, from a coordinator, assistant director, director level. Um, and I think it was at that point that I realized there were theories and frameworks and models out there that explain the world of work. And I wanted to better understand those. And so that led me to pursue higher education, um, which really just sparked an interest in organizational development. Um, and so that's my academic background on a practical um, day to day. Um, I am in student development, career management. Um, but really, I think it was when I was responsible for issues of organizational development that I said, wow, this is actually a thing that's out there that I didn't know that, that it got me excited and out of bed in the morning. Um, but it did, and so, so I, I pursued it. Awesome, awesome. In your presentation, you mentioned uh, perceived performance, especially in the, in the first slide with the various models. And I was wondering kind of what's the relationship with uh, perceived performance and productivity? Um, you know, I think that's one of the bigger questions about working remotely is how does it impact um, a staff member's productivity? And, and so I just was wondering if there's a relationship there or if you if they're similar terms talking about the same thing. 
Yeah, and let, let me, I hope this is gonna answer the question. If it doesn't, let me know. Um, the literature that I've been reading was specific to perceived performance um, because it is so difficult in the virtual world, the remote world of work to actually see what others are doing throughout the day. Um, so I think with, with perceived performance, it is how am I viewing what my coworkers are doing in terms of quality and quantity, is it enough? Um, and from a popular press point of view, what I've been reading um, is that employers and, and managers can focus on output rather than the strict, are you working from eight to five? You know, if you can get your job done, and I, don't, and I certainly don't want this to trump any organizational policies or anything like that. But it seems that managers are okay with, as long as you're getting your job done, we're good. Um, so with perceived trust, I think, I'm sorry, with perceived performance, um, knowing how communication and trust lead to that, I think employ, you know, you still actually have to do a job, right? And, and get to your output. That's gonna be an issue if you don't. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's also important to manage that perceived performance as well, um, because it, 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 it does create kind of a, an environment and a culture. Mm -hmm. So I hope I haven't wandered too far off track. Um, no, I think, I think that's, that makes sense to me. I mean, as you're, as you're talking, I'm thinking about it in a few different ways. There's the, the quantity, right? And that's where it's, you know, getting the work done and, and the amount of time that it takes. And to your, you know, to, to the, the phrase that you used in your presentation, the amount of widgets you need to produce. Like if you're producing those widgets, then that's the, the quantity of the work. So that makes sense. And then there's the quality. You know, obviously the widgets have to be up to the standard that the organization is, is seeking. And that makes sense. Um, but then the communication piece, it almost um, causes me to think of a, the word presence, you know, that, that, your, that your colleagues and your, and your managers have a sense that you're there, you know, that you're available, that you're responsive. And that's that communication piece, I think. So that all, does that make, does that framework kind of make sense? I, I absolutely agree with you. It, cool. it does. Um, yeah, it just ties back to, you know, are we in this together, basically? Right, uh, right. Communicating and building trust. Um, then you know I, i'm happy as an employee i'm engaged um, very cool yeah the trust seems like a key element so that's that makes sense so the last question i have is is kind of a summary um it, it was a it was a question that i derived early in the in in your presentation and then um it evolved as it went along and then your last slide was really i think hit a lot of these so it's it's really about how to how to to do this well, I guess, as well as we can. And staying positive was one of the early indicators that you know, one of the things you mentioned that's important. Um, also the, the whole boundary theory and finding a kind of a, a system that works for you. It sounded like there wasn't necessarily a right answer unless there, like you also said, like unless there's a company policy about here's right. how we're going to do this, that it's more about finding out what works for an individual. And, and um, you know, even experimenting through different modes and types of, of boundary theory to see maybe put those ingredients together and see what works best for, for each of us. Um, but, but even, even so, um, and even with your tips at the end of the presentation, you know, many of us may run into a wall at some point and just feel, you know, especially those of us who, who really appreciate and need that high contact and being in the same room with folks that, you know, so I just was wondering if, if you had any other tips, even though you've probably given us, you know, everything that you have, but just in case if you had any other advice or maybe even just a closing thought, um, for those of us who are, you know, who are experiencing this and so many of us are working remotely and working from home and having our personal professional lives intersect in ways that many of us haven't, you know, what happens if we hit that wall? What do you, what do you, any other suggestions? Yeah, um, you know, I guess the only other thing I would offer is take, take an analytical approach to figuring out what's going on. Is it a family to work conflict? So your family life is imposing on your work life or is it the opposite is that is that the work life is imposing too much on family life and you know kind of breaking it down that way might help you figure out where the source is and then making adjustments uh you know talking with your, your family members partners spouses um and just being honest like hey i'm, I'm struggling i think it's okay to say that i'm struggling a little bit in this area um here's what i'm perceiving 
what are your thoughts about making this adjustment um, and then going from there? Okay, so even using employing that communication, that high communication with family members or, or, or with your team and, and at work, that, that's, that's awesome. That's, that makes sense. I like the way you kind of broke it down into these two kind of general approaches or mindsets and um, that, that's awesome. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I, this is awesome. This is one of our early um, sessions that we're putting together for Roostream. And so it means a lot to have you participate. Um, and and your, your presentation was as engaging and informative as I, as I expected it to be. And I really appreciate your time and expertise today. Um, and I also wanna thank our viewers for tuning in. If you enjoyed this presentation, stay tuned for the official launch of Woostream. This virtual programming platform will be um, adding new content weekly once we officially launch. So um, thanks again, John, Jonathan Schramenti, for your time and, uh, and really appreciate it and looking forward to seeing you around campus once we're all back there together. Absolutely, my pleasure and go Bearcats. Go Bearcats, thank you. Thanks everyone.